恭敬大德三品，为师法为济一切众生，尽传妙法论，教导我们如何疗伤，脱死离苦。速战无上。Will the Sangha with great virtue, out of compassion, for the sake of this assembly and all living beings, please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach us how to leave suffering and attain bliss? And end birth and death, and quickly realize non-birth. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambhutasa. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo Sadanto Sucheto Ye Alahati San Miao San Puto Che Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Chen Wan Jie Nan Zao Yi Wo Jin Jian Wen De Sou Che Yan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in a billion eons. But now we see and hear it, and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, my Lord Master, and all good knowing advisors, welcome back. This is、uh, class number seventy-three, as we explore the Dharma using the Medicine Master Buddha Sutra as their foundation.、Um, today we have、uh, the human realm.、Uh, we we are fairly. We have、uh, fairly done with the animal realm. Now we're going to move on to the human realm,、uh, which is our realm. And、uh, I hope that there will be. I have some interesting things to share. So hopefully,、uh, is some of them you haven't heard before.、Um, okay,、uh, let's chant Medicine Master Buddha's name sometimes. Namo quelling disasters, lending life. Medicine Master Buddha Namo, 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 quelling disasters, lending life. Medicine Master Buddha, Medicine Master, does come one. 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 Okay, let's get to this slide going. Let me end this slideshow. Okay. Um, 
again uh, before we get going with today's class if you have any questions um, things to share or anything interesting from last week's class or any general questions about the dharma uh, just unmute your mic or tap it into the chat box all right so today we are at um the human realm okay we've uh, we are progressing from the bottom we've done the hell realms we've done the uh, the realm of hungry ghosts then we move on to the realm of the animals uh, we are doing that because in the shurangama sutra that's how the buddha has um uh brought us to to the, the 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 realms of the destinies as the buddha uh put it ron do you have a question uh uh yes that thank you for yes. asking me um this this picture that you have um what is it supposed to represent i mean i i'm looking at it but i i, I it, it it um it looks really well done but i don't know you know uh I'm sure you mentioned before, you explained it before, but I've, I've since forgotten. Okay, uh, good question. Okay, so this uh, is a, uh, how you say, based on how in the sutras the Buddha has described um, the Buddhist universe. Uh, they use the word cosmology, Buddhist cosmology. A lot of people have tried to graphically represent the, the Buddhist cosmo, uh, cosmos so that we can have a better understanding of how things are laid out. Like for example, when we talk about the sun and the planets, we, we have the solar system where you have all the planets revolving around the sun. Uh, and then if you take a step back, um, you see it's, uh, how you say, the, the relativeness of the, our, our solar system. So so if you look at just the sun, the earth is spinning and as it spins, it revolves around the sun. Okay, it has an orbit around the sun. But if you take a step back, you realize that, oh, is the sun is not stationary. Actually, our solar system is traveling through space at a tremendous rate. And so the movement of the earth is not just revolving on its axis or off its axis. I'm not sure which one is the right one. Uh, but it doesn't revolve 90 degrees. I think it revolves half. Uh, it doesn't just revolve. Uh, it orbits the sun, but at the same time, that whole solar system is moving around space as a uh, as a group, as a cohesive group. And then you take a step further, you realize that our universe is um, expanding or contracting. I think it's expanding. And there are other universes. And around us, there are universes that collide. And there are other things like black holes and, and, and different things like that. So we have gra graphical representations of that. So this is a graphical representation of the Buddhist cosmos, where you have the um, our realm, uh, no, not our realm, um, our world system. Yes, world system. Our world system, which is supported by the four discs of uh, uh, fire, uh, smoke, or sometimes they call it mist. So you have the air disc, and then you have the fire disc, and then you have the water disc, and then the earth disc in, in that uh, arrangement, suspended in space. And then in each successive disc or in that location uh, where the beings are. So the hell beings are described as at, at the lowest, and then the heavens uh, are described as at the top. And then there's Mount Sumeru, and a lot of these places you will see described in the sutras when the Buddha speaks. They will say uh, at the top of Mount Sumeru, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, the, the Buddha spoke, uh, or here or there the Buddha spoke, or some of the Jataka tales, uh, they happen in all different locations. And then, for example, in the Earthstar Sutra, uh, when they speak about the hells, this provides you an idea of where everything is located. Does that help, Ron? It's like a map. Yeah, it's a map. Yeah. Okay, but it's not a map, not just of physical places, but you can uh, kind of like uh, different dimensions. And uh, let me show you what, what I mean, uh, different dimensions. Today we are going through the hell realm. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, no. 
uh, we are going to the human realm, which may sometimes uh, feel like the hell realm. Um, um, and human humans exist in Buddhist in the Buddhist cosmology on four different continents. Okay, so if you look at your screen, there's Uttara Kuru on the uh, which is on in north. Languages that are based on Sanskrit, uh, like the Malay language, you will find Uttara familiar because we in the Malay language we use Uttara for north. I think in Indonesia as well. And then in the east, you have a continent called Puba Videha. In the south, you have Jambu Vidpa. That's where we are, Jambu Vidpa. Okay, and in the west, there's a, another continent called Godaniya. So these are continents that have been mentioned in the sutras. But the other three continents, Utakuru, Purva Videha, and Godaniya, are not accessible to us uh, without spiritual abilities. Meaning, if you can't fly and you can't enter a different, I would say, uh, for lack of a better term, a different dimension um, or different plane of existence, then we won't be able to see these th three continents. Yeah, uh, and you can see we're kind of stuck in in Jambu Vidpa. There is a story uh, that I told about the Maha. Parusa, the great, uh, a great man, the one with the 32 hallmarks, who are destined to either be a Buddha or a wheel turning king, uh, if you all remember. One of the stories that I told, and one of the details that I didn't share because it would make the story too long, is that uh, when the Maha Parusa was in one of the lands, I think he came to uh, Jambu Vipa or something. Uh, or he was originally from Jambu Vidpa. Because he was there, we had inhabitants from the different continents come to that continent where he was. Uh, but when he left that continent, uh, somehow or other, because he was no longer there, these inhabitants, they lost their ability to return and they were stuck in that continent. Yeah, something like that. Okay, Ron, does that kind of answer your question somewhat? Yeah. I, I think that's enough. Uh, I, I don't think I can absorb any more. It's so it's so um, so foreign. I mean, you know, I think in time, you know, if I um, get more information, I, I'll uh, uh, you know I, I might be able to understand it. I mean, I'm I'm happy just understand that I'm from Jampu Vipa. <laughs> okay, all right. Why I'm <laughs> okay. The reason why I'm sharing all this is not because we have to uh, know all this or we have to memorize all this. Uh, the reason I'm sharing all this is to understand cause and effect. And uh, so all these are just, uh, these are all just details, details that for people who find it interesting, uh, they can learn more. But the main takeaway is cause and effect. What do we do to enable, uh, to create the conditions that cause birth in the various destinies and based on what you want for yourself, how you can adjust your practice. All right, okay. That's the most important takeaway, meaning uh, uh, when we investigate the sutras, we always ask ourselves, how is this relevant to me? How, what use can I get out of this to make myself uh, a better person? Okay, so things like this, it's interesting to know, um, do we, have to know to, for it to make a difference in our practice? Uh, not really, um, but it helps in our perspective. Okay. So I've already mentioned the four continents, all right? And humans are found on these four continents. Okay, but what kind of humans? Uh, they're not uh, uh, exactly the same as, as us on, on Jambu Vipa. So let's look at the physical char characteristics, okay? So humans that live on each continent, it is said, have faces shaped like the, the, the land mass they dwell on. That means the shape of the continent that they're on, uh, their faces kind of resemble that. So it means that those, those on Jambu Vipa have roughly triangular faces. That means we our uh, foreheads are wider than our chins. So it gives us a roughly uh, triangular 
kind of shape. And then uh, Godania have round faces because the land that they're living on is, is like, has a round shape. And <laughs> Utarakuru people have square faces because they live on a, on a square land. And then Puwa Videha have faces that resemble the semicircle of a half moon, uh, like a crescent. You know, probably they have a forehead jutting out and a chin that's sharp and, and juts out. They are, I don't have a photo, but you know, there are people uh, drawn that way. Uh, so uh, that's Puwa uh, Videha. Okay. And uh, then let me see. Uh, it is said that uh, I have my notes here. I don't know why it's here, uh, but I'll, I'll just share in case I forget. They say people in P Puba Videha uh, do not sleep, uh, do not have houses. They just sleep outdoors. Yeah. Uh, they, they don't, they, maybe they have no need for shelter, so they sleep outside. And then the people of Goda Nia, they have this special uh, wish fulfilling cow, a wish granting cow that whatever you want, the cow gives it to you. I don't know how it works because there are very, very few descriptions about that. Uh, but it is said it is one of the blessings of people at uh, Godania. Yeah. Um, uh, sure. Yes, can, Ron. Can ask you, the humans that are in these other three continents, uh, even though they have different looking faces, do they, you know, I mean, do they have the same uh, limbs, the, you know, like, are they taller? Are they shorter? Are they, I mean, do they have more limbs than we do? You know, they have more than two arms and two legs. Uh, <laughs> okay, they're humanoid. As far as I know, they've been described as uh, humanoid. I think that's the right term, meaning legs, just like us, upright beings, two legs, two arms. Okay, whether more like monkeys or not, I do not know. Uh, but in terms of height, that's actually the next slide I have. In terms of height, it's very interesting. Jambu Vipa are the shortest. Okay, we have an average of about 150 centimeters to 180. That's about five feet to six feet on, on average. Okay, and then uh, Pruva Videha, they are twice as high as we are. So they go up to 3.6 meters. And then Godania uh, is, they are twice the height of Puwa Videha. And then if you go to Uttarakuru, they are even uh, taller. They are twice the height. So 14, 14 meters, uh, how many feet that is that? Uh, that's like, is that close to 50 feet? Yeah, so they, they, they're huge. Um, that's the different height that they have. Okay, and then we have a question from Saha. The four continents are higher than us. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by higher, so except they don't know any Buddhism there. Okay, I know in Uttarakuru, there's no Buddhism. Uh, the sutras have described Uttarakuru, uh, uh, or I read somewhere, I don't know the source, that, there's, that Buddhism, the Dharma does not exist. There's no one teaching the Dharma at Uttarakuru, but I'm not sure about the other two continents. Okay, let's move on to lifespan. Okay, lifespan for Jambu Vipa, Jambu Vipa us is unfixed. That means it ranges, the average lifespan ranges from 10 years to 84,000 years. So there's two ways to look at this, meaning um, you can die young. Okay, that's one way to look at it. Anyone can die at any time. That means unfixed. The other way to look at it is over time, uh, I've talked about this before, Every, Shufu says every 100 years, the, there's a cycle where every 100 years, the lifespan decreases one year. So that begins when the, at the peak of human lifespan and the peak of human lifespan is 84,000 years. So there'll be a time where humans in Jambu Vipa actually live 84,000 years long. And it's an amazing time. Uh, we, a lot of us have spiritual abilities at that time and we are not aware of uh, things like lying. It, we, we have no concept of lying. We just naturally hold the precepts and, and that's why we have such a long life. So from 84,000 years, uh, Ron, do you have a question? If not, I'm gonna mute you. Yes. Uh okay, all right. So when, when our lifespan is 84,000 years, then every 100 years, it decreases one year. And until it reaches 10 years. 
and I won't go into detail because I've talked about it before. And then from 10 years on, that's the lowest of the cycle. And then it begins to increase again at the rate of one year at every 100 years. So that's the second way of looking at the unfixed lifespan of human beings on Jumbo Vipa. First is within one single person's lifespan. And, and second, it is a, a, a long cycle where the average lifespan increases and decreases. Uh, in Purwa Videha, they have a longer lifespan, 250 years, and it corresponds to their height of um, being twice of us. And Godaniya has 500 years lifespan. Uh, that's probably why they are twice as high, or I don't know how it cor correlates. And then what's interesting at Uttara Kuru is, at, is that the lifespan is fixed. Everyone has the same lifespan, 1,000 years. You will not die a premature death. Uh, Otara Kuru. Yeah. All right. So no untimely death at Otara Kuru. So let's go a bit into Otara Kuru because uh, I thought it was a bit interesting. Uh, the humans of Otara Kuru surpassed those of Jambu Vipa and even the Devas of Triam Trimsha in three respects. So Devas of Triam Trimsha means the heaven of the 33. Okay. That's the Triam Trimsha heaven. I'm pronouncing it in the Sanskrit way. Tamam Timsa is the Pali, uh, Pali spelling. Okay, so Uttarakuru humans surpass the gods in three respects, which is they are they they are not selfish at all, and they have freedom from acquisitiveness. Uh, I may not be pronouncing it correctly, but I think the meaning means that they don't possess things. They don't have like a uh, a sense of this is mine, that's yours, and and all the problems that that comes with. So they share everything. They have fixed lifespans. And why? Because apparently, uh, I think gods in the transition heaven, sometimes they have they might have premature death or their lifespans are different. And upon death, will be reborn in the heavens. So you don't really fear death there. You, you know, you know how long you're going to live. And when your time comes and say, oh, you know, uh, I'm going to the heavens, it's, it's stress-free, and they enjoy exceptional living conditions. I'm not sure why this is a uh, advantage over the, the, the gods of the 33, because the gods of the 33 already uh, have uh, exceptional living conditions. So I, I'm not sure how to reconcile that. Uh, maybe their exceptional living conditions is like a paradise on earth, kind of like that. Yeah. Um, one boy has a question. Uh, does the giants recorded from East and West cultures may come from the other continents? Uh, I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, where, where the, those stories come from. Um, so this is the Buddha speaking. Uh, there's a sutra called Sutra on the limits of life where the Buddha talks about the lifespan of human beings. And he talks about the different continents. So he says, so he's explaining why they have a fixed lifespan. He says, why do the human beings who inhabit the continent Otaraguru have a lifespan of 1,000 years and not experience premature death? Buddha said, monks, the human beings inhabiting the continent have no sense of mind and no notion of ownership, and their lifespan is predetermined. When they die and pass from here, they progress higher and higher, and in the future, they go to heaven. Monks, this is why they have a lifespan of 1,000 years and do not experience premature death. I'm not sure if that really, now that I'm reading it again, I'm not sure if that's really a reason why they have <laughs> a fixed lifespan. Okay, but, but that's the, the way the Buddha explains it. And then there's more. Buddha says, being so are stricken by poverty, hope for the riches of others, because they have not served and relied on noble beings, they will become the low and mean servants of others. The affluent and rich, possessing all kinds of enjoyments as well as money, grains and servants, are those who have served and relied on noble beings. This means um, they have uh, paid respect, venerated and made offerings to, to sages. Uh, and says, those who live meritorious lives by performing virtuous actions here and now who delight in great prosperity and abundance like a deva, like a heavenly being. Okay, so this is the reason. So he's saying that uh, the occupants of Uttara Guru previously 
have um uh they have this kind of blessings because they have served and relied on noble beings they have venerated and they have made offerings to sages so it says performing virtuous actions okay now let's move on to the next slide but i said since what is beyond the range of sense perception is not apparent look directly at what is present when people experience happiness in this world that is a coming result of former generosity the humans inhabiting the northern continent uh, this is utara kuru I have no sense of mind and no notion of ownership. They use clothing from the wish fulfilling tree. They experience neither cold nor heat. They are free from illnesses and they possess perfect bodies and complexion. This, that is the karmic result of former generosity. Okay, so because of uh, they were formerly very generous, you get to be born in the continent of Otarakuru. Yeah. So that's how, all right. Uh, and they have this bush fulfilling tree. Yeah, what is it like? I don't know if it's an actual tree, but just I maybe think of, I don't know, if you like fashion, you can just walk into the shop, pick up the best clothes that you like, and it's all free. You know, you don't have to pay for it. Yeah, something like that. Okay. Uh, the Buddha continues, says, on the Northern continent grows very white rice whose grains are unbroken smooth pure and clean pure light generating crystals shine for beings uh, continuously and cook their food they have no vegetables not even a little dull they always eat rice and dal with perfect color smell and taste that is the result of former generosity see what happens you don't even have to cook your food you have the greatest rice in the world to eat and you don't have to um, their fire or how they cook is uh, light generating crystals which is which is very very interesting it's very sci-fi like very futuristic uh, with only one serving of that food until they get up from their seats the food on their plates is inexhaustible okay so it's just like the heavens yeah uh, that means the, as long as they're sitting down and they still want to eat they don't have to go for a second help <laughs> uh, they, they don't even have to to go through the trouble of getting more food because the uh, the food just magically appears says a fruit that resembles the bottle god grows on branches even when cut one can eat them off the vine wow okay so when you if you cut off a branch of the tree you take it home the, the fruit will still grow and then the rivers there carry cool water that when drunk does not harm the stomach and that possesses the eight superior qualities that is the comic result of former generosity okay what are the eight superior qualities of the water uh, it, it it said it's cool that means it's not uh, hot it cools you down it's sweet it's light it's soft it's clear it's flavorsome it does not upset the stomach and it feels very smooth in the throat Okay, so that's uh, the eight qualities uh, of water. Then the Buddha continues, he says, The people of Otarakuru constantly divert themselves with magical trees that emit music. Their minds are always happy. The lovely magical music trees, the many magical garment trees, the perfect smelling perfume trees, they are the coming result of former generosity. Perfume, flowers, music and garments too. Whatever the heart desires manifests exactly as imagined. Ah, okay. So that's why it's uh, uh, superior to the heaven of the 33. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of people are very excited. There's a lot of comments in, uh, which, in the chat box, which I'll read later. Okay. Buddha continues. It says, on large green meadows with grass soft like cotton wool, they enjoy themselves all day. They are without anger. Never begrudging or jealous, they enjoy one another. During the first watch of the night, a rain shower falls for only an instant and cleans the air of dust. This is the coming result of, of former generosity. Okay, next slide. Since they are not possessive, even the mother and son relationship is unknown to them. So not possessive means um, they don't have, they're not attached emotionally. Okay, not like... Uh, 
other regular humans. Buddha says, when nothing unpleasant exists, sorrow is non-existent. They have no sorrow. Mothers can even leave their children on empty roads and go their way because milk trickles from everyone's thumbs. No one cries there. When someone dies, they just leave the body and go on their way. Birds come and clean the island of the corpses. That is the res coming result of former generosity. This uh, custom of leaving the corpses out for birds, I think is, is still practiced. Uh, is also practiced in, uh, by some cultures in, in the world here, in Jabu Vipa. Uh, I think in the Middle East, something. The whole of Uttarakuru is enclosed by a moat, within which they safely enjoy and divert themselves with song and dance, most beautiful to behold. The people there live for 1,000 years and they certainly use it up. They do not die prematurely, having fully enjoyed this beauty and abundance. Even though they will have to forsake their human bodies, they will take rebirth among the devas. That is the karmic result of former generosity. Okay, so uh, that's Uttara Kuru. Okay, so now look at let's look at some of the. Okay, so Saha says there's no Buddhism Uttara Kuru. How can they even hear the Dharma? Uh, they don't. They don't. There's no one there to teach uh, the Dharma. Uh, Randy has the same question. I did read somewhere though that uh, uh, one of our uh, uh, Dharma brother or sister. Uh, made a vow when Shufu was around. He made a vow. He says that since there's no Dharma in Uttara Kuru, he made a vow to propagate the Dharma there in the future. And Shufu said that's quite a good vow. Yeah. So there you go. I'm not sure if the context for Shufu saying that, uh, but that's what uh, that's what I remember. And then, uh, okay. Saha reminds us that we all have a wish fulfilling pole. It is called chapter 25 of the uh, Universal Door chapter. All right, thanks for that. Okay, now let's go to us. Okay, uh, now we know what Uttara Kuru is. Uh, now let's come to Jambu Vipa. The Buddha says, on the other hand, the humans of Jambu Vipa surpass those of Uttara Kuru and the Triumph Trimshika Devas in the three qualities of. So we are superior to, to the beings. Now that we know Uttara Kuru beings have such a, a lovely life, um, but we are superior in three ways. Okay. N number one, heroism. We are able to go beyond, uh, our comfort levels in order to help others. Heroism. Number two, mindfulness it says only among the humans of Jumbo Vipa is there a suitable mix of happiness and affliction conducive to mindfulness. So I think maybe that's why there's no Dharma in Uttara Kuru because the life there is so pleasant, there's no affliction, that the Dharma doesn't really make sense. Because even when they die, they know that they're going to the heavens. So there's, they don't really have anything to worry about. There's no suffering or affliction to overcome. Uh, and then number three, the holy life. Only in Jambu Vipa do Buddhas and Pracheka Buddhas arise. And only here is it possible to follow the eightfold path in fullness. That means only in our con on our continent can we uh, walk the path. Why is this? Well, because in Jampu Vipa, we have a balance of pleasure and pain. The Buddha says to be born a human, uh, if you remember the, uh, a few classes ago, we have 50% uh, of emotion and 50% of logic so that gets that gets you reborn as a human so this means that we are not overwhelmed by suffering to the point where we cannot practice how in the, that happens in the lower realms of or someone who says undergoing a lot of grief um, and the mind doesn't work properly at that moment because it's so emotional it's really really hard to practice uh, so that's what it means that there's a balance of pleasure and pain, not too much pain that prevents us, prevents us from, from practicing and not too much pleasure that makes us forget why we should practice. Okay. All right.
So from here on, we're all uh, mostly referring to uh, beings in Jambu Vidpa. Okay. Ron has a question, does cause and effect hold in the other continents? Yes. That's why the Buddha is explaining why the beings of Jambu Vipa, uh, uh, not Jambu Vipa, the beings of Uttara Guru were enjoying such pleasures is because of former generosity. Ron? Yes. Any being, every being in the Buddhist cosmos all fall under uh, cause and effect. Okay. Um, so here in the Buddhist cosmos, uh, in the in the realm of Jambu Vipa, this is from the publication called the Buddhist Cosmos. So all the beings of the plane of sense desire are characterized by mental processes informed by the five physical senses through which they relate to the outer world. It just means that all living beings, the way we interact with the world is through our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Actually, there should be six. Uh, but it says five physical senses. It says the impulses that dominate their mental life and bodily actions are a desire to obtain pleasant sense experiences and to avoid unpleasant ones. It means we like comfort, we dislike discomfort. All right. Although sense, desire, consciousness is a default level for beings born into this plane of existence, it is possible for them to experience mind moments classified as belonging to higher planes. As for instance, when a human meditator enters jhana or dhyana and experiences consciousness at the level of the plane of form. It just means that we have the ability through quieting the mind, either reciting the Buddha's name uh, or sitting in meditation, reciting mantras until you reach single-minded concentration, then we our consciousness expands and we get to experience um, uh, how you say elevated forms of consciousness something like that yeah so it says here in the human realm there's a balance of pleasure and pain this means that full awakening is most readily attained here this is what we spoke about earlier uh, that is it says at least for some humans neither so much pain that the being is overwhelmed into helplessness nor so much pleasure that he or she is unable to discern a problem with samsaric existence. Okay. It goes on to say, we can easily take our human existence for granted, but understood in the context of the entire cosmos, it is an exceedingly rare and fortunate position to be in. It is a general rule of the cosmos that the lower realms are greatly more populous than the higher ones. The Buddha said if the number of human beings were represented by the dirt under his fingernail, the number of beings in Niraya, that's the hell realms, would be equivalent to all the dirt on the great earth. So one function of uh, Ron, you were asking about uh, the graphical representation. When we see ourselves, say, on the, on, on the map, and we look at where we are on the map we become very small and then uh, when astronauts they say that when they leave the the atmosphere and they look at earth from a distance they realize how small and fragile the planet is and that as an individual we are just you know everyone's in together but sometimes we get lost in in our uh, perspective and we think kind of like the world revolves around us and we take for granted that our human we take for granted now first of all our human birth the fact that we are human being right now and that we can um, not just human but the fact that we can uh, encounter the dharma which is exceedingly uh, difficult in this world and the second thing is we kind of take for granted that our future existence is going to be a good one. You know, we don't really fear or put much thought into our future rebirth. We, we, most people just assume that they're going to be humans again. Uh, but it's not true. Uh, if you look at the graphical representation, we see that, oh my God, you know, the, the, the Jumbo Vipa itself, or the, the four continents itself is just a very small part of the entire Buddhist cosmos. All right. So when it comes to our ability, uh, 
to be reborn as a human being. Let's move on to the next slide. The Buddha says, if a being uh, once falls into the lower realms, his chance of regaining a human state is compared to the chances of a blind turtle in the great ocean who comes to the surface once every hundred years, or putting his head by chance through a yoke floating on the surface of the sea. So this is the famous metaphor used by the Buddha. The Buddha says, imagine a great sea, you know, take your pick, Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, South China Sea, and there's a piece of wood floating randomly on the sea, and there's a hole in the piece of wood, and there's a turtle that lives in the sea swimming around. Every hundred years, the turtle comes up for a breath of air. Every hundred years. And it says the chances of the turtle coming up for air and poking his head through a hole, through that hole in that piece of wood that's floating randomly in the sea. That's your chances of being reborn as a human if you were in the hell realm. So it's very, very hard to get out of the hell realm, which means that now we understand or we're trying to understand cause and effect. We have to be very, very careful of planting any causes at all that will create the conditions of a future fall in our rebirth. Okay. Uh, sure. to be... Yes, Ron. Uh, I, I would like to ask you if, if, you, if it's possible to know where, where all these slides, you know, if we can look up these slides ourselves to read about it, you know. Okay, I've shared before the book called the Buddhist Cosmos. Oh, so, it's called the Buddhist Cosmo. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I didn't know. I thought it was just the title here, but that's the name of the uh, text that you're getting this from, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, this is from the Buddhist Cosmos. Uh, okay. I try to always put the source as, okay, let me move on to the next slide. Like for example, this slide, it, the source is the sub, if you look at the orange colored words, yeah. yeah. Samyutta Nikaya, 56.1172, that's the source. Okay, thank you. Yeah, but if you're not clear, just ask because it's very, very, it's, uh, how you say? Shufu says we shouldn't like speak uh, speak Dharma without the without relying on the, on the Sutra or on the source. And the source is important because the Buddha himself, he said that when we listen um, to the Dharma, then we should always go back to the source to confirm for ourselves uh, what he said. Yeah, so the source is, source is very important uh, because I might be explaining it uh, differently from, from uh, or other people may have different interpretations or my interpretation uh, may not be right. Yeah, or may not be the whole uh, story. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is the famous sutta where the Buddha talked about the, the earth and the fingernail. The Buddha, so it says, then the Buddha took up a little bit of soil in his fingernail and addressed the bhikkhus. He said, what do you consider bhikkhus? Which is more, the little bit of soil in my fingernail or the great earth? And the monk said, Venerable Sir, the great earth is more, the little bit of soil that the Buddha has taken up in his fingernail is trifling. Compared to the great earth, the little bit of soil that the Buddha has taken up in his fingernail is not calculable, does not bear comparison, does not amount even to a fraction. Okay. The, they really emphasize that. <laughs> okay. Then the Buddha says, so too because those beings are few who when they pass away as human beings are reborn among human beings. But those beings are more numerous who when they pass away as human beings are reborn in hell. For what reason? Because because they have not seen the four noble truths. What for? The noble truth of suffering, the noble truth of the origin of suffering, the noble truth of the cessation of suffering, the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. In other words, they don't recognize the peril of samsara and they don't re realize that you can actually do something about your, um, your fate, your rebirth, your path in life, and that suffering can end and that there is a way to end suffering and it's called the Dharma. So they don't know that at all. So without knowing that, they create offenses and they fall. So if you look at uh, the human population, um, there are very, very few people who actually base their lives uh, on, on, a wholesome, on a wholesome way of living. 
Uh, so that's what the Buddha is describing. Yeah. So going on the same sutta, the Buddha said, therefore, because an exertion to, should be made to understand this is suffering, this is the origin of suffering, this is fault. Uh, by the way, this is a fall noble truth. Uh, this is a cessation of suffering, an exertion to be made to understand this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. Meaning, in other words, open your eyes and truly recognize the position that you are in, in this life. Okay, it is very, very peril perilous. Yeah, that's the word, perilous. Very unsafe. Okay. So, the Buddha says, So too, because those beings are few who, when they pass away as human beings, are reborn as human beings. But those beings are more numerous, numerous who, when they pass away as human beings, are reborn in the animal realm. Okay, so your chances of being reborn in the animal realm are higher than being reborn as a human being. But not just that. This is the same format, but it says ghosts. Our chances of being born as ghosts are higher than being reborn as a human being. And not just that. Buddha says that um, uh, so too because those beings are few who when they pass away as human beings are reborn among the devas. But those beings are more numerous who when they pass away as human beings are reborn in hell, the animal realm, in the domain of ghosts. So in other words, if we do not practice and take control over our destinies, then we are gambling with what's going to happen to us. And according to the Buddha, our odds are not good at all. If you leave everything up to chance, you hope for the best. That's what gamblers do. They hope for the best. You know, um, well, the, those are our odds. Fingernail, dirt in fingernail uh, compared to the amount of earth or dirt uh, on earth. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a lot easier to win the, 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 the hardest lottery on earth than, than, than that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have some questions today. Uh, while I look for my questions, uh, does anyone else has any questions you want to bring up? Any observations? Okay, let me read the chat box. Uh, Saha, what if we make a vow that we do not want to be born in any other worlds except Amitabha Pure Land, but our karma is not good enough to be born in Amitabha's land? Um, so yes, so why we are going through the Dharma and all these different things is all for one reason, so that we make the necessary steps to be reborn, reborn in Amitabha's Pure Land. Okay. As for the second part of your question, uh, Saha, it says our karma is not good enough to be born in Amitabha's land. Well, there are nine grades of rebirth in in um, in the pure land, and it seems as if like the lowest grade can be achieved by almost anyone, as long as you lessen your attachments to to the to samsara to the Saha world. And then you um, you recognize the suffering, and you don't really want to be there. And then you make vows to want to help living beings. That means uh, you, in other words, you you realize the importance of practice. And if you have a choice between, say, like listening to a lecture, going to the temple, uh, helping other people, compared to something that brings pleasure only to yourself or comfort only to yourself. You are not selfish. You train yourself over time so that you always choose the the option that contains dharma. Then I think that uh, based on the nine grades of rebirth, uh, it seems as if the pure land is fairly accessible. Amitabha Buddha really, really wants you to be reborn in the pure land. Yeah. So uh, that's beyond the scope of, of today. Uh, being reborn in the pure land and the nine grades, but you can investigate uh, further yourself. Yeah. Okay. Ron asks, is there killing in other continents? I do not know. Uh, are there greed, anger, and delusion in the humans in the other continents? Well, based on what was described for Uttara Kuru, it seems as if uh, probably not, or to a very 
lesser degree. Uh, the other two continents, Godinaya and Puwa Videha, not much is mentioned about them. Yeah, so uh, we don't really know a lot about them. Okay, I have a lot more on the human realm uh, from the Shurangama's point of view. For example, from being reborn as a human, coming from the animal realm, going up. Uh, but we are running out of time, so we'll keep that for next week. Okay. Now let me look at the questions. Okay, so today we have the questions. One of the questions is when should we recite the Medicine Master Buddha Mantra? Okay, in uh, when Shu Fu explained the uh, the Medicine Master Buddha Sutra, um, he explained that if you go to our temples. In the morning ceremony, we recite Medicine Master Buddha's mantra and a praise to Medicine Master Buddha. And in the evening, we do the Pure Land praise and then uh, the Pure Land rebirth mantra. Shufu says they, they both play a role. We have the greatest affinities with Amitabha Buddha and second comes Medicine Master Buddha uh, uh, for us. We have the greatest affinities with those two, those two Buddhas. So Shufu says that, uh, the, let me see, um, as we go about our daily life to be protected by illnesses and, and everything, uh, that's where we rely on Medicine Master Buddha. And, uh, but when we are looking towards our future for our next rebirth, we look towards the Western Pure Land, which is Amitabha Buddha's Pure Land. So that's how they kind of fit into with, with one another, yeah. As to when is a good time to practice the Medicine Master Buddha Mantra, I would say all the time, yeah. Um, as you go about your daily life, as, you, as you're eating um, any mantra for that matter, it doesn't have to be the Medicine Master Buddha Mantra, it can be the Great Compassion Mantra, for example. Um, whether how you say some people think that oh i want to be re because i want to be reborn in uh, amitabha buddha's pure land can i still recite medicine master buddha's mantra yes whether you get to be reborn in which pure land depends entirely up to you okay your intention uh, creates the opportunity to be born in that pure land okay no one's going to force you to go to a pure land you don't want, want to go to Okay, so you can recite Om Mani Padme Hom, you can recite Great Compassion Mantra, you can recite Medicine Master Buddha's Mantra. Uh, it does not affect the pure land that you want to be reborn in. Okay, the, that, that's one. So you should recite it all the time, as often as you can. Uh, but in daily life, there are certain times where you need to concentrate. So you have to be smart. There are times where, say, if you are... Uh, doing something that requires concentration so you don't mess up you don't you are not a danger to yourself or to other people you know like when you're driving and uh, there is i don't know a particularly dangerous situation you cannot get lost in the mantra you know uh, or you're walking in a place that might be dangerous and you need to pay attention where you step where you go then make sure you pay full attention to what you're doing but at other times, you know, when you're eating, uh, when you're brushing your teeth and all that, when you're taking a shower, uh, those are excellent times to use the mantra so that you don't get lost in your false thoughts. So instead of false thinking, you are using your mantra. Then sometimes like when you're working and you're having a conversation and all that and you need to concentrate, then you can put the mantra down and you can then uh, you can do whatever you need to do then after that, when you're done, instead of false thinking again, you go back to the mantra. So when to recite uh, Medicine Master Buddha mantra? All the time, as often as you can. Okay, I hope that answers the question. If not, uh, ask more. And then we have two questions regarding next month, which is uh, the month of Qingming, or the All, I think English they call it All Souls Day. So that originates from the Ulambana uh, Sutta, 
and it has been throughout so long the Ulambana Sutta has taken on a, uh, has been co-opted by Taoism and different cultures and other religions from around the world and it has transformed itself into sometimes uh, losing the original meaning of Ulambana uh, so always remember that Ulambana is for Buddhists Ulambana is the true All Souls Day okay all right so the first question is if because of COVID and people are in, in, unable to travel to the ancestors' graves uh, in Chinese culture, I'm not sure about other cultures, during Qingming or that particular day, uh, it is a custom to go and clean the graves of your, of your ancestors. So the question is, if you're unable to do that, can you do it at home? Uh, yes. Bas you know, okay, from my understanding, the whole thing about going to the ancestors' graves is to to remind yourself of the kindness that you have received from your parents or from your grandparents and to reinforce uh, the feeling of gratitude and need, and the need to repay that kindness. Okay, it's a reminder. It should be every day, you know, but you know, you can't do certain things every day. So it's, it becomes once a year, but it should be every day. Okay. So, um, what, so if people understand that and they do the right thing when they're at the grave, okay, then you do the same thing at home and it's the same. But if you, you know, for some people, they, they don't really understand the meaning or they never think about it. They just go to the grave site and because it's something they have to do and then they go away, you know, then it's kind of meaningless, you know, so you, there's nothing to be said for that. But if you truly understand it's to remind yourself to repay the kindness of uh, people who have shown you, uh, shown you the kindness. Then at home, you can recite the sutras on your parents' behalf, on your grandparents' behalf. You can recite the mantras. Uh, you can make offerings to the triple jewel and dedicate the merit to them. So yes, if you are unable to make it to, uh, to where either the ashes have been kept or to where the grave, grave site is, then yeah, you can, you can do it at home. It's, it come, it's, it's in the heart. Okay. It comes from the heart. All right. Um, then the second question is, uh, if you're at the grave, what sutra to chant at the site? Okay. So the de facto sutra uh, is the Ulambana Sutra. That's what, if you come to the monastery on Ulambana day, we chant the Ulambana Sutra three times. So the Ulambana Sutra is about um, how venerable Mahamagliana, uh, which is uh, famous for having the foremost spiritual powers. When he became an Arhat, he decided to look for his mother and he found his mother as a hungry ghost and with, with nothing to eat. So he felt really, really sad. And because he had spiritual powers, he was able to provide his mother with some rice. But the moment the mother put the, the food in her mouth, it turned into hot coal and it burned, it burned, it burned her mouth. So this made him really sad. And despite his uh, spiritual abilities, he was not able to help his mother. So he went to the Buddha and he, and he told the Buddha what happened. And the Buddha said, even you cannot help your mom, but what can be done is then the Buddha said the collective, um, uh, uh, he says, he uh, says, okay, this is what should be done. People who want to help their relatives should make offerings in the basin. That's where the word Ulambana comes about. I think uh, I might be wrong. Uh, make a basin of offerings to the collective monks and nuns. And it is the collective virtue of the monks and nuns that will be, and uh, that helps, that will be able to help all the beings that are born as hungry ghosts. 
So that's how Ulambana came about. So what we also know, which we've covered in classes before, is that the Buddha says that the beings, the, the hungry ghost beings are unable to receive the offerings directly. So you can't offer, make an offering directly to uh, your ancestors and uh, think that they're going to get it. That's, diff that's the a Taoist belief and, and other beliefs. But in, in Buddhism, how it works is this. Uh, and it's in the Ulambana Sutra where Mahoma Galeana uh, made an offering to his mother and his mother couldn't accept, accept the offering. So what have, how it works is this. When you make an offering to the Triple Jewel, to the collective virtue of the Triple Jewel, on behalf of the person uh, you want to benefit, because you are making such an awesome offering and it's to the triple jewel, it means there's bound to be some sages there. That the uh, the hungry ghosts, on the hungry ghost part, to make the offering complete for themselves, they have to generate, uh, what's the word for it? Um, they have to rejoice in the act. So when they see you doing something on their behalf, their part is that they have to rejoice and that rejoice, that joy, uh, creates merit for themselves and then they can get the benefit. So that's how the offering uh, works. It is not you making a direct offering to your ancestors. Okay. If you're going to go through all the trouble to make offerings, you make it to the triple jewel, but on their behalf so that they know that, oh, you're doing something good for them. Their heart can rejoice in your um, offering and through their rejoicing, they create merit for themselves. Okay. You have to be very clear on that. They are, the Sutra explains in the Sutras. And then someone asked the Buddha, he said, uh, what if I do not have a relative that's a hungry ghost? The Buddha said impossible. Buddha said that it is impossible that a person does not have someone, does not have a relative that has been reborn uh, in the hungry ghost realm that will not benefit from, from, from offerings. So throughout our, um, uh, they say uh, ancestors from seven generations past, uh, some people see it as like grandparents and then great grandparents and then great, great grandparents. Uh, but I think a more accurate description would be ancestors from your, from your past seven lives. That means who your past life once, past life twice before, third before, your ancestors from there. Yeah. So the Buddha said it is impossible that a person will not have an ancestor that has been reborn as a hungry ghost that will not benefit. So wow. just, just do it. Yes, Sorry Mr. to interrupt, Pastor. Mm. Um, you say that we need to make offerings through the three jewels so that our ancestors can receive it, right? My knowledge of Buddhism is not very in depth. So does that mean that when I go to the, tom uh, the tomb or at home when I'm praying to my ancestor plague, the offerings that I made, um, they can't receive it? According to the Buddha, yes. The Buddha said that when you make offerings, uh, there's a sutra which I shared before in a previous class. The Buddha said that uh, if they are, have been reborn as animals, they cannot receive it. If they are reborn as in the hell realm, they cannot receive it. If they are reborn as humans, they cannot receive it. Uh, and then if they are reborn in the heavenly realm, they also they cannot receive it. Only beings in the hungry ghost can can receive when you do transfer transference. But it is not a direct transference. You have to offer it to the triple jewel or it's a virtuous act. And then they have to rejoice in it. And then, then they can benefit. Um, that's, previously, that's according to the Buddha. Yeah. Uh -huh. Because previously, uh, Teng Pian, during this session, they do have some kind of uh, ceremonies where we can actually... Um, Go to the temple and, and, and do it in that way. So now that um, the temple is not open, so how can we make sure that you know okay. our for, offerings for, are... For Ulambana, 
the temple the temple does still does receive offerings you just don't come and 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 participate that's all oh okay yeah the the temple is closed but the temple is not closed to offerings because people still have to generate blessings and to and in cases like this you know do uh uh so that means I have to call up the temple to find out the procedures to do that. So, right? Yeah. Yeah. Have you called to find out or you just assume that we are totally close? I just assume. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> mm. All right. Okay. So coming back to the okay. question, what, what sutra to chant? Well, the Ulambana Sutra is a great sutra, but you don't just chant it for it to be really effective. You know, you chant it in a way that also activates the wholesomeness in you. So understand the reason that you are chanting is at the very least, yes, you want to help uh, your ancestors, number one. But the, the whole point of the sutra is to make, um, make a person realize that they need to repay the kindness that has been shown to them. Okay, so that's one sutra to chant. The if you want to consider other sutras, uh, the Earth Store Sutra might be a bit too long, but you can do it at home. The Earth Store Sutra is another great sutra to chant. It's a sutra on being filial, meaning repaying kindness. Um, and why is a great sutra to chant? Because if you truly absorb something like the Earth Store Sutra then you can follow in the steps of Earth Star Bodhisattva because in the Earth Star Sutra, there are stories of how Earth Star Bodhisattva became Earth Star Bodhisattva. As a daughter, there are two stories where um, uh, she was the daughter, she, she was a daughter and she wanted to help her mother and she made a vow to help all living beings as how she can help her mom. Very similar to uh, Maha Magalana, Venerable Maha Magalanya's uh, story in the Ulambana Sutra. And those were the seeds that she planted for her to become Earth Star Bodhisattva. So the Sutra is not something that you recite and then just because you have to do it or because you think it's good and then you put it away. The Sutra is, is man, man, man as a, um, uh, a guide of who you can be in your own way. Okay. So look at the sutras in that way. It's a guide to show you, um, the best that you can be. Yeah. Something like that. Then you, then, then, then the merit that you transfer, uh, uh, will be, uh, then, <laughs> then you have like real merit to transfer. Okay. All right. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. If not, then let's, uh, stop here for today and we can transfer merit. That's my slide. Yes, Saha, what's your question? Dharma Master, I want to know the, um, the other worlds that you talked about in the four continents. Do they ever travel to our world to see what the human or they all stay in their own worlds? They never travel to here. Uh, yeah, I mentioned this earlier. Uh, when I, a few classes back, when I shared about the, um, the great being where a human is born with 32 hallmarks, just like the Buddha. Uh, and the destiny is to become either a, a Buddha or a wheel turning king. So one of the stories had the wheel turning. So if you remember the wheel turning king first gets the, 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 the wheel, the wheel appears to him, this magic wheel that enables him to travel everywhere around the four continents and the four seas. Uh, and he, he and the entourage, his whole entourage, his army, his, his ministers, his advisors, they all travel on the wheel. They, they visit each continent 
and each continent has their own like sea and the wheel goes into the sea, separates the, the water and they go collect all the jewels in the sea to finance their countries. It's very, very interesting. So in one of those stories, the people from the other continents actually follow him back to his original continent. So yes, they do, they are able to visit. But in that story, uh, when th this is the story where this king, uh, when he was in, he went to the heaven of the 33 chakra, Lord chakra, uh, invited him to be co, uh, what's the word for it? Co king. So they had the heaven of the tree had two kings and he outlived uh, many, many Lord Chakras. I'm not sure if anyone remembers the story I told. So anyway, when he went to the heavens, the beings that traveled to with him to the other continents, they were stuck in that continent because they had no way to go back to their continent. So that's the best I can answer your question based on the, uh, and this story was told by Shakyamuni Buddha himself. Yeah. Whether they can travel by themselves, I don't know. But I do know that, you know, you apply effort in, in your practice and, and you have spiritual abilities, then uh, I, I, you are able to travel to, uh, to, the, to the different continents. Yeah, that much I know. Okay, dedication of merit. Any other questions? Keep it for next week. All right. All right. Uh, let me change my sound settings. So you can hear the bell. All right. May every living being, our minds as one and radiant with light, share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving unity, may our minds awake to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of our endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. Okay, let's do three bows to the Buddha. First bow. Second bow. Third bow. Half bow. Bowing respect to the Venerable Master. Second bow, third bow, half bow. Okay, everyone, um, Saha says a very interesting lecture. Yes, but like I said, the biggest takeaway from this, if you ever remember one thing, is cause and effect. And it's very, very hard to retain a human body or to be reborn as a human. Uh, so. Be very, very careful with our thoughts, speech, and action. All right? Okay. Amitabha, everyone. See you next week.